good afternoon, everybody. I would like to call to order the Public Works Committee meeting for Tuesday, July 12th, 2016. First order of business is roll call and determination of quorum. Brenda, whenever you're ready. Doyle? Here. Estes? Here. Salomon? Here. Drew? Here. Nordstrom? Here. We have our quorum. Thank you, Brenda. Next order of business is to adopt the agenda. Do I have any changes other than what is before us? Seeing none, I would look for a motion to adopt. Move to adopt. Motion by Nordstrom, second by Solomon. All those in favor? Aye. All opposed, same sign. Agenda is adopted, thank you. Now is the time for general public comment, which is a time for members of the public to discuss or express concerns to the committee on any issue not limited to items on the agenda. Action, however, will not be taken at the meeting on any issue not on the agenda except by placement thereon by unanimous vote of the alderman present. I have no general public comment forms, so we'll go ahead and move on to consent items number one, numbers one through 12. I will open public comment and seeing no speaker forms for those items, close public comment. Any uh, committee member would like to remove any consent item number one through 12 for separate consideration? Mr. Estes. Item 12, please. Same one? Okay. Yep. All right, then I would entertain a motion to adopt the balance of the consent calendar items 1 through 12 with the exception of number 12. So moved. Second. Motion by Nordstrom, second by Drew. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. All opposed, same sign. Consent calendar is adopted with the exception of item number 12. <coughs> Item number 12 is to approve the dead or diseased tree removal program. I see we have staff at the podium. Would you please introduce yourself and go ahead and give us your presentation, sir, whenever you're ready. I'm Andy Bernard. I'm the uh, city forester for Rapid. Um, you guys have seen this before. Uh, bringing you back to you with some revisions. Um, what you have in a packet um, that I just handed you is... Uh, a small survey that I did um, a few weeks ago. So as stated in front of you, a visual survey of Rapid City shows that many street trees and right away trees are in poor condition. It is clearly evident that Rapid City's greater urban forest is in a state of deterioration. Seeing the condition of the city trees, a sample survey was conducted June and July 2016. Uh, the major points coming out of this was a six block survey uh, included 126 trees 12% of those trees were dead, 10% were very poor condition, 26% poor condition, and 1% were hazardous. Uh, roughly 36% of the trees surveyed um, should be removed. 55% um, of the trees that were surveyed were Siberian elm, which we all know are, are kind of the big hazard in our city right now. Um, the rest of that um, you, you can read as, as you need, but uh, I do have a few few graphs that uh, kind of portray, I don't know if this thing's on or how to bring that up. Well, the tree species one, uh, it just shows the distribution of, of species um, and you can see 55% Fifty-five percent is Siberian elm um, in in this survey area. Uh, the, the second biggest one would be green ash, which which is another problem tree in the the possible near future. Um, the second graph is the condition of trees, and at forty-nine percent of the trees in the study area, uh, forty-nine percent of the trees were poor or worse. So poor, very poor, dead or hazardous. Um, this is. A big problem it's it's not just an individual homeowner problem it's a community problem all of these trees actually impact city right away uh, sidewalks community areas so we need to we need to look at this this program as, as a, a management tool that the city can use for its urban forest not just a, a social program to help people remove their trees it's actually a management tool that forestry staff can use to manage its forest 
uh, that, that being said, I would open it up to any, any questions. Thank you, Andy. Do I have any questions for Mr. Bernard? Mr. Nordstrom, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Andy, thanks for the orientation on this project. I've, I haven't had a chance to read all the up, current updates or the whole document that you've presented here today, but um, I've liked the direction of what this is going. The uh, area of interest for me is over in the uh, Robbinsdale area, and specifically the old Robbinsdale. We've got a lot of trees in, the, in this same type of condition. In fact, I was uh, recently stopped by a citizen that says, when are we going to get this ordinance through? So uh, I'm supportive of it because we've got this local interest from the neighbors and the neighborhood. Um, the other area that I've really liked what you've done for a change or amendment to the previous uh, ordinances is the uh, cost that you're uh, allowing for, and well, maybe not so much you, but for the uh, uh, community development division is working up for the uh, people that are uh, below the median income and then those that are at the median income and, and over. Can you address those a little bit further as that's what we're uh, going to be looking at? Absolutely. Yes. Um, so we broke it into, into two, two classes, basically. Um, those below 100% area media income and then those above 100% area media income. So for cost share assistance below median income would be 100% of the cost of removal of that tree up to $800. Um, above median income would be 75% of the cost up to $700. And these, these would cover trees from 35 feet from the curb, curb front back and any city right away trees. So basically front yards, your visual corridor down any street. Thank you. And, and uh, is there some rationale behind the numbers that you came up with? The, I'm, I'm looking at the $800 per, per homeowner, uh, uh, and then the other one is the $700 per homeowner. Have you got some rationale behind that? It's kind of based off the cost of tree removals. Um, I've been exposed, worked in the tree care industry for a long time. I know what it costs to remove a tree. It, it may be more expensive than $800. It may not, um, but it's a starting point. Uh, it'd be a good judge after we run this program for a year if that's the, if that's the right amount. My guess is that's really really close. You're going to see a lot of trees in the the five to one thousand dollar range. So that'll that'll cover a lot of lot of tree removal costs that that we're going to see. You mean in five hundred dollars to five hundred to to one thousand? You're going you're to see trees in that that range. Thank you. I think this is a good start. So Andy, I appreciate what your efforts that you put in behind this and. Um, when you get to take this out in the community, I, I'm, I feel confident that you're going to be getting more favorable results uh, from the community than what you have gotten in the past. So good luck. Thanks. Alderwoman Drew, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my, my comment, first of all, is that, um, you know, we wanted to go towards the low income um, areas because I had heard that the people that were taking the most advantage of this tree removal program were probably in higher income brackets simply because they knew about it. So I think we have um, an awareness uh, building effort that we need to get into here. Um, I think for the median low income people, I'm not sure if, um, you know, how many of them read the paper or would watch you know, Channel 98, you know, with the city feed or, or how we can get this word out. But one thing I might suggest, something that everybody gets is a water bill, utility bill. So maybe, um, you know, for the, the areas that are low income, that are targeted for this tree removal, that, you know, you guys might get together and um, put some kind of a line there that please contact if you have uh, trees that you're concerned about and need removal in your area. And that could be a targeted mailing, uh, targeted message, you know, and would really build awareness to the to target groups we're trying to reach with this outreach and this help. Um, and that's that's my only comment. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Mr. Solomon. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, one question I have is I've, I see cottonwoods are on here, and they're quite expensive to remove. 
do you do you think the eight hundred dollars let's say is enough incentive to remove those I, i'm thinking there's neighborhoods where rows of cottonwood trees line the streets well, we're, we're not trying to remove live cottonwood trees we're okay. looking at the dangerous the dead the hazardous trees um i would say if you have to take a, a dead cottonwood down mm -hmm. eight hundred dollars is a lot better than nothing yeah i just wonder i wonder if it's enough incentive i've i've taken one down it's it was a lot of money it was a total of ten thousand with the uh, stump removal so it was pretty no one was willing to do it that was why but and the other question is are you forgive me for being new are you doing the parks doing this are you doing this or are you outsourcing this to a, another company I, I am housed within the parks uh, division but I, I work with uh, engineering uh, code enforcement fire department police department so I, i'm more of a city forester than just a parks but yes this would be me and my staff conducting the early parts of these um, and then as far as the contractors removal that would be contracted out through the homeowner itself we would just do the initial inspection uh, looking at the trees that are to be removed and okaying those trees and then coming back in after the trees are removed and making sure that the work's been done okay thank you thank you we'll go on to mr estes please Thank you. Um, this, uh, you know, I, I see this as an incentive for somebody to that needs to have trees cut down. What, what happened? Where do we sit if if somebody doesn't cut their trees down? Code enforcement sends them a letter. They ignore that, and we have to hire somebody to go cut their trees down. Then do we give them credit back for this? If if we had to if we had to do it through a code enforcement and that whole policy, not not all code enforcement trees would qualify into this program this would okay. this would just be but let, let's assume they would because i think now now uh, and i didn't mean to interrupt you but i think now as we talk about code enforcement and some of the issues we've had you're probably going to be signing off on trees that code enforcement's going to try to force somebody to cut down right and and if they and if they ignore that and then we're going to do it through assessment so then if we do it through assessment and then are we going to are we going to give them credit or are they going to pay 100 percent because that that really tells you whether or not this is going to be an incentive or not so that's not that little caveat in my mind isn't in here and that we're getting close but i i just got to tell you i can't support this right now i i i have a little hang up with uh segregating our community as the income on this a tree is a tree a dead tree is a dead tree um a component of the funding of this is the general fund a component of the general fund is property taxes so so now we're telling you know you know not always but but generally you would say well the a person that makes a little more money might have a home that's assessed a little bit more so we're telling the people that maybe pay a little disproportionate share more in the general fund and property taxes that that they qualify for less of a program i i'm, I'm not sure i'm there i, I well, today I know I'm not there because I have some questions. But uh, anyway, I just want to let you know, as it sits, I would vote no. Because so for one group, you're going $800. And the other group, you're going 75% of 700 So you're really segregating our community based upon how much wealth we think somebody has over, you know, 100 and some dollars per, per situation. And I, I just, I don't. I'm not, I can't support that. Thanks. I would like to say that the original program did not have any segregation as far as cost shares. This was in response to the city council's recommendation. Some of the city council's recommendation. Thank you. You done, Mr. Estes? I'm done. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, a couple questions for Andy, if I may. Um, when you say a, a tree averages about in that five hundred to thousand dollar range, how, what's the diameter of those trees typically? That that really would depend on on the technical difficulty of the removal of the tree. But you're you're talking twelve to thirty some inches, so pretty pretty good sized trees. Uh, most of these trees that that are in tough shape are Siberian elm, um, a few others sprinkled in, but the majority of them are, and they are large trees, twelve inch plus. Uh, trees thank you and I may have missed it but how many trees within rapid city limits do you anticipate this program actually taking care of over time a lot uh, you know 
initially with just the, the, the current money we have, uh, I fi we figured around the 300 trees, Jeff, a, a, year? a year. Okay, thank you. Mr. Nordstrom, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think Alderman Estes has a good point about that, and I, I did, uh, did ask for the rationale behind those two numbers, but could you repeat that again for, for those numbers? As in the actual price that is the, right. the reimbursement price is, is there. Um, well, we met with, with Barb Garcia over this stuff, um, and, and we took her recommendations to write the low income, um, and she used my recommendations of actual removal costs. So between me and her, we kind of came up with the two-tiered system. Originally, her idea was even more, and it just it got really complicated. So two tiers is, 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 is kind of as is, is much willing as, as, as the Parks Department can take. If we go any further than that, then it's more convoluted and, and, and just gets really, really strung out. Um, so so the, the, the pricing is actually my, you know, that, that covers kind of the average cost of, of tree removals. Um, but the, the, the range is eight or 700 it came from, from Barb and, and her staff is to have, you know, different prices for. Thank you. Um, the, uh, so it, uh, I would agree that this, that portion needs to be looked at or re-examined one more time. The other part of it is on the reimbursement. Uh, I think Alderman Assis brought up a good question as well as the point that um, if it goes through abatement process, then the, the issue will be uh, uh, through the reimbursement. They have to request a re reimbursement first, correct? It does. There is a process lined out in here. So to answer Brad's question, if they don't go through the process, they don't qualify for reimbursement. You would need to follow the process laid out in this program to qualify for reimbursement. If you don't have it bid, if you don't provide the receipts that you had it cut and paid for, you don't qualify. So that, that answer would be no, because they wouldn't have gone through the appropriate channels to, to qualify for the reimbursement. So, then, then, in other words, we have to go through the abatement process, and if we get into a string of trees that have to be removed, it, it could be another uh, complicated issue uh, at that, that point. But the, the key emphasis, what I'm trying to get across, is uh, the reimbursement. The people, uh, the citizens that are asking for these trees to remove, they have to go through the reimbursement process. Yes. And then we should not have an issue with the abatements after that, correct? Correct. Okay, should not. Thank you. I'll yield. Thank you. And before we move on to Alderman Estes, I would like to mention that we do not have a motion on the floor. So if any committee member would like to see some kind of changes to this, now would be the time to consider that. Mr. Estes, please. Thank you. I wasn't prepared to make a motion here. Uh, just two more questions. Um, on the whole, on the median income, does so is the town divided up into areas? Is it shaded as to what areas? Or, or does, does a person actually bring their tax return in to a city person to? This would all go through community development whether they qualify for this. I, I don't know how the town's broke up as far as that. It would, it would be individual homeowners' income that would qualify them for where they sit on the reimbursement okay. scale. All right. And then w the, only, the only point I would make when you were talking to Richie about is if this goes to the abatement process, they wouldn't qualify for reimbursement because they wouldn't have the, the receipts. But I could see somebody standing there saying, well, you, you got the receipts. The city hired that person, so you know what it, co you know what it costs. So I just think it, if, if the abatement process it doesn't qualify for this, I just think it needs to be specifically spelled out in this that, that should a homeowner ignore everything and it goes through abatement the city has to do it then then that, that process does not qualify for this program just so that it leaves no no question thanks I yield Alderwoman Drew thank you madam chair um Andy um how many think how many apps do you think you'll be looking at and how long do you think it take a staff person to go through those applications Oof. And just a, yeah. you know. uh, as far as the application itself, um, our secretary and myself and, and possibly two other of our arborists would be the actual ones on site. Well, the arborist and myself would be the ones assessing it. Uh, our secretary and me looking at the applications. Literally, the application would come in. We would go inspect the site. It would be a 
half hour, 45 minute visit per site, uh, talk to the homeowner, see what they're looking at, whether or not those trees qualify, um, approve it, then they could bid it out. Once it's bid out, get, get, it, get, it, get them cut, send the receipts back in, we'd go look, make sure the trees were cut, and then uh, it would be up to the uh, financial side of things. Yeah, to get, get so it's kind of a long process is what you're saying. It, it would be, yeah. I mean, it would be up to the homeowner how quickly they would get, get the, the property taken care of. Okay, and, and um, unlike Alderman um, Estes, you know, I think if you have the wherewithal to take, your, take care of your trees, you should. You should. And so medium, low-income people may want to, you know. I mean, we're looking at hazardous uh, trees. You know, might be um, a safety issue with uh, property and um, uh, injury, things like that. And if we have to step in and take care of those to make sure we have a safer community, I feel good about that. And um, I would I would like to to just go ahead and, and see this go through as written. So um, I don't know how far I'll get with this, but I, I move that we. Um, You've already spoken. We'll have to get some. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is okay. Sorry about that, but um, anyway, I could I could support this. Thank you. Thank you. We currently have no motion on the floor, although there was an attempt. Um, <laughs> we'll go to Alderman Nordstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll, I'll make a motion to that we acknowledge this at this point. I'm not ready for a draft resolution or, or anyway, that's, that's my motion, just acknowledge this report. So it goes. Currently have a motion to acknowledge. I do not have a second. It sounds like there may be some questions. What I would suggest, Richie is withdrawing that yes. motion for a moment so yeah. that it doesn't Withdraw. die and then um, we can have that debate. So really the question is, is this committee inclined to approve it as is, or do you need, are you not in support of the program at all, or do you just wanna see a different iteration of it before you can get your support behind it? Alderman Solomon. So I like the program overall. I think the, the objective is good. I, my struggle is with, with this uh, splitting up of the payment, which you just want to cut down the trees. So that's at the end of the day, I think we want the same thing. Um, how we go about that, I think more work would have to be done on that. I, I, it feels like we have too many questions and I don't I have a hard time recommending it to council at this point. Thank you, sir. Another option we do have is to roll this to council without recommendation, have a discussion with the full council on Monday night. Mr. Estes. Motion to uh, send to council without recommendation if I can keep the floor second that way it'll give everybody else a chance to tune in maybe somebody can tell me I'm all wet and if they can convince me of that I'll oh, that's fine so that's my motion okay, we do have a motion and second to send to council without recommendation so that we can have a more robust discussion Monday night is there any further discussion seeing none all those in favor Aye. All, Aye. all opposed same sign Motion to send to council without recommendation carries. Thank you. We are now on non-consent items 13 through 18. We'll open public comment. We do have a number of speaker request forms. You have to forgive me for not being able to read some writing. Paul Jensen, did I nail it? Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Jensen, if you, Mr. Wright would like to go first. Yes, sir, please approach the podium. And Jerry, you're speaking on item number 13, correct? That is correct. Jerry Wright, Councilman Ward 3, and it's my writing, thank you. Um, you just dealt with trees, and I know the council's dealt with deer and ducks and geese, and I guess it's time we talk about turkeys. And this is based on a call that I had from a constituent of ours in Ward 3, Paul Jensen who lives on Canyon Drive, also has property in other parts of the community. Concerned about the amount and number of turkeys within the neighborhood where he lives in Carriage Hills and what they do to the property. And I met with him with the game wardens in about January. We talked about it and really nothing further went after that. I met with Jeff and we, I was asked to be on the uh, agenda for the wildlife committee, I think it's called. And we had a great discussion there with the game wardens because they were there. 
And there were some ideas brought forth there to include such items as maybe we should do some information on um, public information on not feeding wildlife in the city because we had the same issue with turkeys and, and uh, excuse me, ducks and deer and other control issues. So I just ask you to hear Paul's concerns. And as a councilman, I would like uh, discussion to continue on this and like to see staff to maybe come back to give us some thoughts on how we can possibly deal with this issue, similar as we have with deer and the ducks and other things. So with that, I'll relinquish my chair. And if it's Thank okay, you, Mr. Paul, I can speak. Mr. Paul Jensen. I'm available for questions like afterwards. Please state your name and address for the record and the floor Paul is yours, Jensen. Sir. Live on <clears throat> Canyon Drive in Carriage Hills. It's an ongoing problem that um, we've created and we have no control over. And the turkeys roost up behind my property and they go in and out every morning and every evening. And they're on my roof, they're on my deck, they're in my driveway. I come off of a ranch. If I wanted to live in a barnyard, I'd go back there and it is a dirty, poopy mess. And it has been for years. Um, and you have to run them off. You look like an idiot running around, flapping your arms and chasing turkeys. And I understand a lot of people think that the problem is because we're feeding them up there. Uh, Brad says he's seen that. I haven't. I know nobody that's feeding them. But I think on, for the sake of the turkeys that we need to have some management control especially uh, with the numbers we have up there now. And if we get a good cold winter, we're going to have a lot of turkey loss, a lot of misery. We're doing the turkeys a disservice. We're doing the humans a disservice. And quite a few people think, well, the, the, the deer and the turkeys were there first. Well, they weren't. It's the grass that, from the thinning that is growing that adds to the habitat, which creates more growth of these animals in, in, the, in our area. Uh, they weren't there before we were there. And the more we thin and the more grass we get, the more prolific they get and the bigger mess we have. Huh? Thank you for listening. Thank you, sir. One more speaker request form for item number 17. Mr. Bill Freytag, please. Bill Freytag, 3821 Brook Street. Um, can we, can we get on the screen the uh, uh, project location map from the agenda item? Daryl, do it. Um, on, on your agenda items on 17, the project location map. can't see it very good that way. It's better if you can see it off of the, if you click on the item, but that's okay. Um, the building, the circle in red is my building. If you go um, to the left of my building, which would be to the west, those lots are, are in excess of 200 feet, so there's 400 feet to the street and then another building. Uh, that first building there do, also does not have a sidewalk. From that particular building that I just said doesn't have a sidewalk, if you go below it or would be going south, there is a sidewalk there. All right, now to orientate you again, if you go back to the red square, that's my building. If you go to the right or to the east, there's activity on that lot um, every day, more so than sometimes there is on my building. That has no sidewalk. If you go to the building next to it, there's an ongoing building, been in there for a long time, has no sidewalk. If you go to the right of that building, it's again has no sidewalk. If you go across the street, that's Fisher Beverage, has no sidewalk. And then from Fisher Beverage now, if you go to your right and um, go one lot, that's Midwest Motor Express, and they have a sidewalk. And then if you go to the right one more time, that's a city-owned property, 
I think it's a pump station, and it has half of its sidewalk. Doesn't have all of its sidewalk, has half of its sidewalk. So what I would um, like to do is just get a waiver on the sidewalk for now, and at some time in the future, if it um, fills in better, uh, maybe we would we you know the go in and do them or do an assess project to do sidewalks. Um, the other thing is this is an industrial park and the foot traffic in there is nil. Uh, it's hardly any at all. And if you compare it to um, Concourse Drive, which is in the oldest industrial park, that whole industrial park has hardly any sidewalks. And on May 31st, you granted a, uh, the waiver I'm asking for in that. Uh, um, subdivision so the likelihoods of sidewalks being in here is compared to uh, where concourse drive is and that light industrial park um, I think it's pretty nil so I would ask you to uh, allow me to waive that sidewalk thank you thank you mr. Freitag we'll now close public comment seeing no further speaker request forms for items 13 through 18 we'll move on to item number 13 which is the discussion on wild turkey control committee the floor is yours mr. Nordstrom please thank you madam chair I'll get this started uh, mr. Jensen could you come to the podium please to the speaker podium a couple of things to clarify for me uh, have you had any uh, conversations with the uh, uh, game fish and parks department about your issue at all several discussions with the former game warden who's moved on up to Hill City he was a good resource Jerry and I had met with uh, John his boss uh, in January as Jerry said We've discussed this quite a bit with the game fishing parks. We need some coordination between uh, the game fishing parks and the city on turkeys, like we have on deer, uh, ducks, geese, that sort of thing. We need some coordination. Thank you. And, and could you elaborate on that coordination? Meaning that is is the game fishing parks ready to make a recommendation on this? They sounded like they were. Are they still, Jerry? Yeah, please. Alderman Wright. I think we should clarify that we've had discussion with them and, and they had input back to us. And the issue is these are game animals, which they control and regulate as they do with deer and ducks and geese. And what I'm asking for Paul, on behalf of Paul, and Paul's asking is the city take an initiative to formally communicate with game fish and parks through apparently parks department is our game management firm sit down talk about the issue and see if there's some things we can do or some things we cannot do because there's obviously a problem in some people's minds but if they are regulated controlled animals you have to have a license to take one out and you have to do it in season and I don't think we want that happening I think it needs to be done through a program as we do with other wildlife thank you and and, and addressing the issue of wild game out there and how to control that if that is the direction that we're the city council is going to go and coming up with a management program with that I'd like to have some recommendation for myself some recommendation from the game fish and parks how to do that wildlife management portion of it well I will again say that we have met with them and I've talked to John twice I think it's John and met with them at the at the wildlife committee for the city and that committee has acted as the agent to work with them to resolve or discuss city issues with wildlife so I think that's where it should go I think there should be discussion at that level from with the committee that handles that issue with game fish and parks and constituents if as necessary and staff as necessary and see if there's something we can or should do and action that could be taken thank you oh. Uh, because for me that I think that's the first step we need to do is uh, have a conversation with the game fish and parks folks so they can come up at, with a recommendation and if we need to come up with a new ordinance or modify the existing or etc then I, th that's what I'd be more comfortable with hearing from what they have to say the professionals what they have to say 
Mr. Jensen, anything else to add to this? If feeding is a problem, you have the same problems with the ducks. If numbers are a problem, you have the same num problems with the deer. So far, you've been managed to do a good job of coordinating those issues. I don't see this as any different. Thank you. I'll you. Alderwoman Drew, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a couple questions for Paul Jensen, too. Um, so are your, are your neighbors experiencing this, too, or is this just a phenomenon of, of your property, or is it neighborhood-wide? What, what's going on? The old original Courage Hills, from what we think of as Courage Hills at the top, really is the whole northern slope. There's about okay. 100 homes in the old original Courage Hills. That's where the turkey problem is. That's where the most thinning has been done. That's where the most grass is coming back that's creating more habitat, which is causing the numbers to increase. Uh, so I'd say the most of the problem I'm aware of is the old part of Carriage Hills. Yeah, I've seen them I've, when I've been up there. And I also have a problem in my ward uh, on, on Barry Pine Road. There's um, a, a lot of turkey activity there as well. Um, have you tried? I mean, what did the game park depart? Game Fish and Parks actually say? Did they uh, suggest some natural deterrence, some fencing? I mean, did they give you any way to uh, keep them away from? Yes, you're laughing, but you know, I mean, <laughs> any way to to discourage the turkeys from being in your property? They were discussing netting. Okay. I have a good open spot in my front yard. They were going to drop nets on them. They had several different ideas. Um, I'm not sure what the solution is. I would assume it's probably more like the deer control where we actually have people who are licensed or skilled with removal. I, I think that probably is where we ought to go. Here's the ir irony, Darla. Those turkeys are alien. They're from New Mexico. My dad brought them up with a head game warden from in Pier back in the early 50s, and that's oh, where all these turkeys okay. came from. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a picture of the first releases of these turkeys. They've excelled in certain areas, and Courage Hills is one of them. I assume that we would have to work with the game fish and parks, and they would probably have to be the ones who do the controlling. They sounded willing. May I just add to that? Paul's correct. In our discussion with the Wildlife Committee, I can walk away with the same understanding that they're more than willing to work with us through that committee and discuss issues. But I don't think we want to see individuals taking action um, managing wildlife. That's not their job, and they probably get in trouble doing it. So we need to turn to those that are by law responsible for it, to game, fish, and parks, and work with our agency, our department that works with them, and discuss and see if there's options that we can take. So. Individual efforts, the number one individual effort may be to quit feeding them if they are, but I think that maybe that if there's an article in the paper tomorrow, we may hear more from people that have issues, but this is brought up by constituent and I think it's valid. It needs to be talked about. So is there a Car Carriage Hills um, a home Homeowners Association or something that's in combating this problem in any way? Or? The, the Carriage Hills what? Homeowners, is there a Homeowners Association? That there is, they're not very effective or efficient. Okay, um, I'm glad, they'll be glad to hear that. So, um, <laughs> um, okay, that, that answers most of my questions that, that you guys have tried to do something, but I, I would probably like to see um, more people from the neighborhood coming forward, um, you know, and maybe you can uh, get a group together to actually, um, you know, talk to Game Fish and Parks and work through us too, so thank you. Thank you, we'll now go to Alderman Solomon. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm going to make a motion that we um, bring this subject back to the Wildlife Committee and have them have the discussions with the Game Fish and Parks about what our next steps are. I'm not sure that we we can do that from up here, but I think that's the motion I'd like to. I make. support that. <laughs> I second. I do have a motion by Alderman Salomon, a second by Estes, to take this back to the Wildlife Committee to initiate discussions with Game Fish and Parks. You still have the floor, sir. I yield. I'm done. Thank you. Any further discussion on this topic? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We are now on item number 14. Appeal of, 
You're welcome. Uh, item number 14 is appeal of exception contingencies and requests from KDM Design Solutions on behalf of Haig Brothers LLC to waive curb gutter sidewalk as second water main north of Moon Meadows Drive, dual water main south of Moon Meadows Drive, and sewer south of Moon Meadows Drive and US Highway 16. Alderman Nordstrom. Madam Chair, if I read the memo correctly, uh, to make the motion to continue this to the next legal and, uh, excuse me, <laughs> used to be on legal and finance, the next public works committee meeting. That is one I've, option, sir, yes. Thank you. I, I don't recall the date off the hand, but uh, uh, that's my motion is to continue this item. To, to. The next public works committee meeting. I do have a motion and a second to continue this item to the next Public Works Committee meeting. Is there any further discussion? Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about this uh, changing, there's uh, some other factors that are involved in this because this is, uh, if I understand this correctly, this has to do with the TIF as well. Um, so that, that complicates the, the issue and as well as 15 and 16 on, on these following items. And um, so I've got some concerns about that. So I'd like to have a little bit more time to uh, visit with some of the, uh, the planning people and uh, the people that actually work on the TIFs and also the partners that are involved in this uh, as well. Um, they've asked to meet with me about this. So I just need a little more time if to, uh, to address their concerns and hear what they have to say. Because I think if I'm understanding this correctly, um, this could potentially reset the base for the TIF. So. That's my concern. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor? Aye. All opposed, same sign. Item number 14 is continued to the next Public Works Committee meeting. Item number 15 is an appeal of denied exception request from KTM Design Solutions on behalf of Haig Brothers LLC to waive pavement, curb, gutter, sidewalk, street light conduit, water and sewer in the access and utility easement along the east lot line and maintain the existing 50 foot wide access and utility easement instead of dedicating 70 feet of right of way with 10 feet of additional right of way adjacent to Moon Meadows Drive. Alderman Nordstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Same motion is to continue this to the next uh, Public Works Committee meeting. Again, this, uh, primarily because I'm, I'm new to the Public Works Committee uh, again, uh, meaning that I've been off of this committee for some time, so I just need to do a little catching up. So I appreciate the, any patience that the uh, committee can afford. Um, it's the, the same issues as uh, item 15, and we'll see the same thing in item 16. Thank you. I have a motion. Second. And I have a second. Mr. Estes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I'm okay with 14, 15, 16. We'll, we'll just extend them on. I, I may have different comments at the council meeting. Um, I, I don't think this resets the base, and, and it really this doesn't have anything to do, in my mind, with the TIF. This, this, has, this has everything to do with, the, in my mind, the, the developer not wanting to put the you know, um, infrastructure in in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a development that's required by the platting requirements. So, but I but I think for for this time to send it on in this manner uh, is fine. Mr. Nordstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've got those same concerns, and uh, as Alderman Estes expressed, because. Uh, it just to stand alone, I couldn't support this. Um, so that's uh, so I appreciate any uh, accommodation so I can get uh, schooled up on this. Thank you. Alderman Drew. Uh, thank you. Uh, along with um, Alderman Nordstrom, uh, Jason Solomon, and myself, this is our first meeting on public works, and I would like to take a little bit more time with this as well. It's not the first time I've seen it, but it certainly is the first time as seeing it as a part of this committee and so I'd like to little, have a little time to school myself as well so I appreciate the motion and so I can look into this a little bit more. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any further discussion? The motion is to continue this for two weeks to the next Public Works Committee meeting. Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item 15 is continued. Item number 16 is appeal of denied exception request from KTM Design Solutions on behalf of Hague Brothers LLC to waive pavement, curb, gutter, sidewalk, street light conduit, water and sewer in Samus Trail. Mr. Nordstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, move to continue this to the next public works. Second. Do you have a motion and a second? Uh, second by Darla Drew. That, uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. All opposed, same sign. And item number 16 is continued. We are now on item number 17, which is the request from Bill Freytag for a variance to waive the requirement to install sidewalk per ordinance 12.08.060 along Seeger Drive adjacent to 3515 Seeger Drive. Would entertain a motion or a discussion of any sort. Mr. Nordstrom. There we go. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll take the slings and arrows on this one here too. So, um, the uh, let me uh, let me ask a, f a few questions, if I may, of Mr. Freitag. Thank you, Mr. Freitag. Um, what I'm interested in is, uh, I understand the position of not wanting to put sidewalks in. I get that. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the concern that I have is when would be this ap appropriate time to put in sidewalks for this area? Um, when, when you have enough foot traffic that demands it, then I would think you would want to do it. Um, and so, Richie, to, to compare it, um, if you go back and you look, at um, May 31st, item number, Public Works 053116-25. That's for 1401 Concourse Drive. Do you know where Cor Concourse Drive is? I do. Okay. And that's an industrial park. And in there, Fisk uh, asked for, for uh, the same thing I'm asking for, uh, on the behalf of Viasat, Inc. And there's no, there's spotty sidewalks up there, but there's not, there's not a real, if there, if there was sidewalks everywhere and we were just putting them in or they were getting all put in, um, then I would put my sidewalk in. But for me to put it in now, nobody's going to use it. It's just absolutely a, a waste of money to, to do it today. And if it goes as many years as Concourse Drive has been, which is probably 30 or 40 years without sidewalks, um, industrial parks are, are, are not residential neighborhoods. They just, there's not much foot traffic. But if we had foot traffic and we needed it, I'd be glad to put in my sidewalk. Thank you. Um, and I agree with you uh, on that, that particular point. But I'm trying to establish a time or, or a, what, what standard do we use for coming, and I know you haven't got the answer. I'm just asking this, perhaps even rhetorically, but uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to determine is we do not have a sidewalk program within the city of Rapid City. Uh, the only time we do a sidewalk is when we do a major street road construction. So any other additional sidewalks to get installed in, in, within the city seems to be a gigantic effort to get that accomplished. And we do have some areas in town that, this is just my opinion, and based on a little bit off of a walk audit that was done by another group, um, they, they would like to see additional sidewalks. And I agree with them and it, it, to that point. But I understand in your situation that we have something completely different. So I can compromise with you on that, but I'm trying to figure out and establish the, the time frame that we can use as a standard. Um, and, and again, you probably don't have the answer, but what can the city do to establish a, a standard for uh, starting up some type of a sidewalk program? Okay, well, I would suggest then to you that you do foot traffic counts. When your foot traffic count reaches a certain level that demonstrates that a sidewalk is needed, makes sense, at that time, you would send me a letter saying, uh, our, uh, we need sidewalks now. 
And so now, Freitag, you either put in your sidewalk or the city's going to put it in and assess it to your property. So I'm going to pay for it either way. I'm not trying to get out of paying for it. Sure. Um, but I think that's your time frame. I, otherwise, we could say, let, let's look at it in 10 years or let's look at it in 15 years. But historically, if you look at the concourse drive area, that's 30, 40 years. So okay. I just don't think industrial parks generate foot traffic like residential or commercial neighborhoods do. Thank you. And, I, and again, I agree with you. Um, it, it's just when I'm looking at Deadwood Avenue, for example, there's a high demand, a high traffic area, uh, pedestrian traffic area up in that area. And we've also got an Elkvale Road. Uh, more people are starting to walk to work in that area. And again, we're not putting in sidewalks. And I'm not criticizing you for it because I agree with you. Um, it's just that we, the city, does not have a very good program in place. So the standards that you're suggesting, I agree with you, but it seems like we still haven't reached that, that plateau yet within, within the city. So thank you. I make a motion uh, to approve the request to Bill Freitag uh, contingent bond him sign in a warp. And if I get a second, I'd like to uh, make, keep the floor. I have a motion to approve with a warp. warp. Second by Nordstrom. So I came in here today prepared to not uh, uh, not approve Mr. Freitag's request, and I was also going to make that motion and I was also going to make that motion and say uh, at the same time we require him to put his sidewalks in let's order the sidewalks in for everybody out there that doesn't have them you know and I disagree with Mr. Freitag I don't think you do counts and then put sidewalks in because I think people don't walk because there are no sidewalks I think sidewalks promote people to walk and you've got Fisher Beverage and MWE and those people out there and maybe maybe they could but, but right now, the reason I switched gears is, is that Fisher Beverage isn't going to come up with an employee health program and say, well, walk, walk a half a block that way and a half back. I mean, the, the, it's an industrial park, and it, and it is filling in very slowly. But I am looking for the spot where I'm going to draw the line in the sand and say, uh, no, put your sidewalks in, but at the same time, we're going to order everybody else because we, if we got to start at some point in time, the line's got to get drawn at some point in time. But um, it, I've just come to the conclusion that it's just too spotty yet to, in my mind, to draw that line out. And I think I voted to on the concourse drive to give them that relief. And so, um, so I I did a complete 180 coming in here. Uh, but but I, man, we we we've got we've. I mean, health and wellness and everything is getting to be such an issue. We've got to get, we've got to draw the line and, and start doing these sidewalks. But uh, this, the, to me, this was the spot to draw the line. Thanks. I have a motion and second on the floor to approve this with a warp. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. All opposed, same sign. Item carries. We are now on to item number 18, which is the amendment to the comprehensive plan by adopting experience Rapid City cultural plan, which is in draft form. And approve a request by City of Rapid City for City Rapid City Arts Council to consider an application for an amendment to the comprehensive plan by adopting this cultural plan. I see Sarah Hansel and Pepper Massey at the podium. The floor is yours, ladies. Good afternoon. Sarah Hansel, Long Range Planning. Item number 18 is a comprehensive plan amendment brought forth by the Rapid City Arts Council to adopt the draft Experience Rapid City cultural plan update. Um, so myself and Pepper will just give you a brief overview of the plan. We'll try to keep it relatively short and then address any specific questions that you have. Um, so this is a plan update. The previous cultural plan, Many Voices, was adopted in 1993 and it guided the vision for several cultural facilities in Rapid City including the Journey Museum and Learning Center, the, public, the Rapid City Public Library expansion, the Dahl Arts Center expansion, and the Performing Arts Center. So a lot of great work was accomplished after adopting the last plan. Um, most of the priorities in that plan have been accomplished. However, the earlier plan's um, directive to respect cultural diversity is yet to be fully realized. Um, the cultural plan was a 10-month process formed by the involvement of nearly 850 local citizens and community leaders, as well as 40 uh, members on a steering committee to oversee the planning process. Keyboards 
Um, we'll take the next slide. Um, the project initiated in, yeah. There's just a couple I can just next. Okay. That works, yeah. Yeah, we'll take the next slide. Can you hear it back there, Mike? Thank you. The project initiated in late 2014 with early research, discussions, and organizing. In early 2015, a cultural assessment identified needs and opportunities through a community survey, focus groups, questionnaire, interviews, and a public meeting. So quite a substantial public outreach process for this project. Then in September of 2015, six task forces reviewed the assessment and they formed the goals that constitute the heart of this plan. Um, next slide. And one more slide. There's um, some directions in the plan about how to use the plan, whether you're a member of the sort of general public or if you're a policymaker looking for specific action items to work on. There's sort of different ways that um, this plan can be used. And the next slide, please. Um, these are the six overarching goals for the plan. They are cultural equity, education for creativity, cultural tourism and local audience development, nonprofit organization sustainability, creative economic development, and cultural leadership. Hand it over to Pepper to talk a little bit about their experience working on the plan. When the Rapid City Arts Council approached then Mayor Quaker to ask permission to facilitate an updated plan, um, the mayor at the time and then Mayor Allender, who was one of the uh, interviews, um, requested that the cultural plan begin with the goals that were already laid out in the um, uh, comprehensive plan. And that was where um, the planning consultant began the work. Uh, each of these goals began with the three very broad goals on the comprehensive plan, but from community input, there was a lot of discussion on priorities for an updated cultural plan. Goal one is rose to the top. Um, cultural equity was key and is a thread throughout the entire document. So every goal addresses uh, cultural equity and inclusion in our community. Um, and then education was the second priority. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, K through five in Rapid City Schools, zero visual arts education is taught in our schools. Um, so you can understand why cultural education is so important to people in this community. Um, I think it's, it's also key to understand that while the comprehensive plan does address arts and culture, it is, as I said, very broadly done. And these goals help our community not only identify the current assets that we have, but the areas that we need to do work in. Um, so I think it's a great outline, and I would like to compliment Sarah Hansel, who has uh, helped us navigate the city process, but also a very strong uh, steering committee who did much of the work with the uh, task forces on uh, creating this document. Oh, and I guess I would also like to say um, that there's already work being done um, in almost every goal that's addressed. Uh, we've already, as the uh, cultural plan suggests, we've already formed a cultural education committee. They've met about three times and are, are doing work. The Cyclorama mural, which is a city-owned mural at the Doll Arts Center, is uh, acknowledged in the cultural plan. We've submitted uh, funding requests to uh, begin uh, preserving that. Um, the Chambers Creative Industries Committee is reviewing the cultural plan once it's approved to determine where they can step in and take a piece of this. Goal six was um, added 
because we knew we needed to have organizations and individuals in place who would take up the work so this document didn't simply sit on a shelf and collect dust. And there, it, throughout the plan, there are responsibilities designated and uh, those groups are already starting to work on this. Then Arts and Economic Prosperity Study is being taken on uh, by the Rapid City Arts Council that's also addressed um, Arts Rapid City, the community calendar, where we continue to do work in that area. So we're already picking up uh, pieces in the plan and the work is, is has already begun. Very good, thank you for your efforts on this. Thank you, Sarah, thank you, Pepper. Do you have any discussion or a motion? Alderwoman Drew. Um, I'd like to move to amend the comprehensive plan by adopting the Experience Rapid City Cultural Plan. I have a motion by Drew and a second by Nordstrom to Perfect. adopt this. Uh, retain the floor for just a moment. Um, first of all, I, uh, I worked on the original plan and um, then in about 2000, I decided, you know, I would see if that, that actually uh, came to fruition. And so I did my own study on it and uh, took that plan off the shelf and saw that we had actually really accomplished many of the things or are well on our way to accomplishing many of the things in that plan. And um, I, I was astounded because it did sit on the shelf, but so somehow organically the people that were responsible took that plan, took their part of it, and made it happen. And now I'm honored to um, sit on that, this new cultural plan as well, and it started in a room full of people 10 months ago. And the work that was done was just tremendous. And we do need a plan going forward. We just can't let this, you know, um, veer off to wherever and hope that we end up somewhere. You know that. My research on the initial plan really proved that, you know, you have to have a, uh, you have to have a direction, and you have to have people that will take you in that direction, and that the change in our community has been nothing less than stellar. We have seen so many um, of our, our facilities grow and um, in, include uh, a lot of populations that were not included before, and so this work is really important. And so I support wholeheartedly as we go forward, you know, to just engage the East of Fifth program and all the arts things that are happening with our young people that are just kind of happening <laughs> indigenously. And it's, it's, it's really a wonderful process to see. It's everything I hoped it would be. You know, so long ago, I could not see this happening. I didn't, I didn't understand how it would actually happen, but it did. And um, it's... It's just been remarkable to me, and, and thank you for all your work and all the people that have worked on this over the last 30 years. It's been, it's been a, a great boon to our city, and when people come in and look at our city and see the, the, the uh, facilities we have, they are astounded. And uh, you know, it brings business here, and, and thank you for all your work. Alderman Nordstrom, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I too want to thank uh, you folks. Uh, Ladies, terrific job. Uh, Sarah, uh, if you're the author of this draft, no, you aren't? Several group, uh, several people put this together as a draft? Okay. I like it. it, it, it and, and you also made a correction, if I understand correctly, and, and throughout the document, it identifies the journey as the journey museum only, and, and you corrected it, I believe, in your comments as journey museum and learning center. So I appreciate that. Thank you for bringing that, bringing we'll that point up. We'll make those. We, we did. You already did. Got it. Got it. Thank you. I knew you would. <laughs> You're that good. The, the other portion of it is the, um, I really believe this will help us understand the arts and culture community as well. Um, the, the process that I'm looking for is, and I'm using the word corridor, um, and I know that's not quite correct, but essentially what I mean by that is if you stand out in the middle of 6th Street and you look to the south, you can see the, the park, the, uh, the uh, Performing Arts Rapid City, PARC Park. Uh, and, and as you go down that uh, 6th Street, there's some other uh, arts and culture just off that path. Go all the way up to the Civic Center and then take a jog to the right, you've got the Journey Museum. So I look at this as a corridor, and I know that's not the correct term that'll wind up to be, but you've also got Anna Huntington that's involved in, in a portion of this as well, and, and, and doing an excellent job through her efforts in bringing this forward. And, and so I really appreciate what you've done and, and provided for us to, uh, to uh, 
uh, bring us to the next step. And I hope that you will be able to do something along this arts and cu culture corridor. Thank you. I yield. Okay, we do have a motion and second to adopt this plan. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries to adjourn. Thank you. Motion by Estes, second by Solomon to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. All opposed, same sign. We are adjourned. Have you seen that?